Hello and welcome to the Mr. Brown podcast, where I reflect on my journey as an early career teacher with a special focus on mental health. I am your host, James Brown. I would like to apologise at the start of this episode for the sound quality. I recorded a full 40 minute episode and then realised at the end that I hadn't turned my microphone on. So the whole thing was recorded via the very small microphone on my laptop rather than my fancy microphone, the one that I usually use to record. So the sound quality is poor, but please persevere. Thank you for your patience. Salutations. The first thing I would like to talk about today is positive versus negative interactions. So a couple of weeks ago, we had a teacher training day. And among the very many interesting things we discussed on that day, one of them was positive versus negative interactions. Now, my school has a points-based consequence system. And I'd imagine that this is the same in many schools. So students can earn positive points, we call them pride points, for positive behaviours. And similarly, they can earn negative points, which we call behaviour points, for negative behaviours. I'm sure that sounds familiar to you. Now, at this teacher training day, we were told that the ideal ratio is five to one. Five positive points to every one negative point. And this is on the level of the teacher. So for every one behaviour point, the teacher should aim to give out roughly five positive points. Now this ratio, five to one, I'd heard about before, but in a different context. I'd have heard about this ratio in the context of happy marriages. I'd heard about it secondhand via some podcasts at some point. So I thought I'd go and actually do a bit of research and see what it's all about. And it is grounded in some serious research. And I'll link this article in the show notes. It's called The Magic Relationship Ratio According to Science. The magic ratio is five to one. This means that for every negative interaction during conflict, a stable and happy marriage has five or more positive interactions. Now, there's a few things that I wanted to highlight from this article that I think are particularly relevant when it comes to not only marriage, but also those classroom relationships with our students. So regarding the one negative interaction, it says that while anger is certainly a negative interaction and a natural reaction during conflict, it isn't necessarily damaging to a marriage. Anger only has negative effects in marriage if it is expressed along with criticism or contempt or if it is defensive. So negative interactions during conflict include being emotionally dismissive or critical or becoming defensive. Body language such as eye rolling can be a powerful negative interaction. And some of these negative interactions are so powerful that they require five or more positive interactions to balance things back out. Now, I thought that the idea that anger not necessarily being a negative interaction was very interesting. So let's think about this in terms of classroom practice. If a student gets something wrong, perhaps they're rude or disrespectful, then anger on the part of the teacher, you know, restrained, controlled anger, may still be an appropriate response. But it's important that the teacher isn't also overly critical or contemptuous or defensive. And God forbid, don't roll your eyes. 
Now, what about the positive interactions? Now, some of these are clearly marriage specific, for example, expressing affection. But there's other ones that I think are more general that could apply to relationships more broadly, including those relationships that you have with your students in the classroom. So one is be interested. If a student has something to say, listen to them. That's a positive interaction. Another one, demonstrate that your students matter. If it looks like a student is having a bad day, take the time to ask them how they are, check in with them, see if they need anything. Intentional appreciation. I really like this one. So zoom in and focus on the positive things that your students are doing well and make sure that they feel appreciated for it. That one's so powerful. There's a member of staff in the maths department at my school who just seems to have this magical ability when it comes to behaviour management. And I think that this might be her superpower. She zooms in on what even the most difficult students are doing well, the positive things they're doing. She finds something positive to focus on and makes sure that they feel appreciated for that thing. Very, very powerful. Another positive interaction, find opportunities for agreement. So during conflict or disagreement with a student, try and think about what you can actually agree on. And importantly, try to see things from the student's perspective. And if you get something wrong with a student, it's important to apologise. This is a positive interaction. It can certainly flip a negative interaction into a positive one. And finally, make jokes. Not to the extent that it disrupts learning and not in a way that undermines respect or appreciation, but still find time for humour. That's a positive interaction. Now, returning to my school's policy of five to one. I do think there's a problem with it. The problem is that it's being applied at the level of the teacher. So somewhere, someone at the school has access to data, which reveals how many behaviour points, those are the negative ones, and how many pride points, those are the positive ones, each teacher is awarding, and therefore the ratio for each teacher. But the problem is that that's an aggregate ratio. It's not considering individual relationships that a teacher has with individual students. So for example, even if I hit the magic ratio of five positive to one negative points, I might be having all of my negative interactions with a certain minority of my students, the ones who misbehave. And maybe that's the only type of interaction they're getting from me, in which case my relationship with those students is going to be awful. Similarly, all of my positive interactions might be happening with the other students in the class. So measuring the ratio as an aggregate isn't ideal. It needs to be finer grain than that. Now, speaking of those positive interactions, I'm going to be a year nine tutor next year. So we have a tutor period at the start of each day, 20 minutes or so, where we do standards and admin and deliver the RSHG curriculum and, to be honest, do a lot of other stuff in a fairly short amount of time. And my tutor class next year is going to be year nine. And in this past week, the current year eights, found out who their tutors would be next year. And that includes my year eight maths class. And I showed up to the lesson on Friday and I had several year eight students run up to me in sheer excitement at the thought that they were going to be in my tutor class next year, which was the highlight of my day perhaps my week. And 
This got me thinking. Well, first of all, the first thought that crossed my mind was why? Why do they? Why are they so happy at the thought of being in my tutor group? Is it because I'm too nice? Is it because I'm a pushover? Do they think they're going to get away with lots of misbehaviour next year? Now, I don't think I'm a pushover. I don't think I am. In fact, I've been quite strict with my year eights this year at times when it's been needed. Yet somehow I've managed to build some good relationships to such an extent that they were very happy at the thought that I would be their tutor next year. Now, I think those relationships are inherently valuable. They are intrinsically good. And that's the most important thing. But if you have those relationships, you can also leverage them toward other ends. So, for example, if you've got those relationships and it's likely that more learning will take place in your lessons. You ask a student to complete a task or listen to you when you're explaining something and they'll be more likely to do it because it's you who's asking them and they like you. They have a good relationship with you. And when a student gets something wrong, you can also play the disappointment card. This is something I found out painfully early on in my journey as a teacher. That if a student doesn't know you, then being disappointed in their behaviour carries no weight whatsoever. Using disappointment as a behaviour management strategy only works once you've got the relationships in place. Okay, it's Patreon plea time, coming at you in the middle of the episode so that you can't run away. Well, that's a theory anyway. I guess you could just still turn the episode off. It just means that you'd miss the final half of the episode. That's a decision you'll have to make. But anyway, this episode took a couple of hours to produce, and I tried to produce a couple of episodes a month. If you think that work is worth at least the price of a coffee, so two to three pounds a month, then please consider signing up on Patreon. The link's in the show notes and you can help me cover the cost of producing the podcast, which currently stand at about 14 or 15 pound a month. Any contribution would be greatly appreciated. Now, back to our regular programming. Okay, now from relationships and behaviour management back to teaching itself, I had a wonderful question from a year seven student this week. I was teaching how to find the mean from a frequency table. So if you have a list of data, a list of numbers, you can find the mean by adding up the numbers and then dividing by the number of numbers. Now, some of those lists can get very long, so it can be better to store the data in a table where you've got the values in the left column and next to it, the frequency. The frequency tells you how often each of those values appears in the list. So for that day's task, I was giving my students a sheet full of these frequency tables and I wanted them to be able to calculate the mean from those frequency tables. And we did a worked example in four steps. I explained that the first thing you need to do is multiply your value by its frequency. Do that for each value and store your answers in a new column. Step one. Step two was to find the total of that column. Step three was to find the total frequency. And step four was to divide the total of your new column by the total frequency. And they got it. They were doing it. It was algorithmic. But after the first couple of frequency tables, a girl at the front puts her hand up and says, But sir, this all looks like gobbledygook. What is it we're actually doing? Why does this work? 
which I thought was just such a fantastic question because it really highlights the distinction between the how and the why. There's an enduring debate in maths education over which one of those two things you should teach first. A lot of people, a lot of educators think that you should teach the why first because it's only once students understand why something works that they'll appreciate the method, the how. Other educators, and I know Craig Barton is in this camp, take a more nuanced view and think that sometimes students just need the how. It depends on the topic. Sometimes the why might be beyond them and it will just muddy the water. Cognitive overload, make them confused. Sometimes they just need to know how it's done. My view is that a little bit of how before explaining the why is a good thing. I think the why can make more sense after they've had a go at the method a few times. And it also mitigates the risk of cognitive overload, throwing too much at your students all at once. So this student asked this question and I told her that was such a fantastic question. And I promised to explain it to her in just a moment. I said, let's get these questions done first. And I promise you that before the end of the lesson, I'll explain why it works. And I did. So final five, 10 minutes of the lesson, I brought the whole class back together and I reminded them that to work out the mean, say if the values are presented in a list, you must add them all up and divide by the number of values. And they're all nodding. They all knew that. Now, the final step of working out the mean from a frequency table is a division. They were doing that, but very few of them had realised that they were doing precisely the same division there that they would have done if the data had been presented in a list. They didn't realise essentially that they were still doing the sum divided by the number of values. And perhaps that's something that I could have explained in my initial explanation, but the fact that I inadvertently kept them separate and the fact that this student then asked the wonderful question, the fact that she was digging for the why, gave me this great opportunity where I explained it at the end and I had my eye on the student who had asked the question and I watched as the penny dropped. This light went on and she was like, oh, yeah. And then all the gobbledygook, as she called it, I love that word. In fact, I'm going to use it from now on. When I'm going through a convoluted method on the board and there's no hint of why we're doing it, I'm going to call it gobbledygook. And so for this girl in that moment, I gave her the why and I watched the penny drop and all the gobbledygook suddenly snapped together and made sense. And that was a nice moment as a teacher. She said, oh, I get it now. Great words for any teacher to hear, I think. And I thought I'd link this to my work on motivation. I'm very interested in motivation. It forms a large part of my master's research. And to be motivated, people need three things. They need to feel competent. They need to feel autonomous. So they need to feel like they're making decisions, for example. And they need to feel a sense of belonging. And in this case, I think this girl was, she wanted to be, you know, properly motivated to do this work. And by asking that question, she was asking me to satisfy her need for competence. She wanted to know why it worked. And I think that's true for a lot of students. Good intentioned students, they want to be motivated to learn and they're looking for motivation. And often we can satisfy that need for competence by explaining the why and giving them a method that makes sense in light of the why. But yes, I'd imagine that the debate around which one you should teach first will rage on nonetheless. Now, finally this week, 
I wanted to talk about completion day. Now, I did my PGCE at Warwick University. And at the very end of the course, they have a course completion day. It's not quite a graduation. We're not allowed to do a graduation because we haven't earned enough credits, but they have a course completion day anyway. And that's something that I enjoyed around about this time last year when I completed my PGCE. Well, I was delighted to be invited back to speak to the new maths PGCE graduates this year. And I did that a couple of weeks ago. Me and my mentor spoke to them about what it's like to be a first year teacher, an ECT1. Now, it was very helpful that around a year ago, I recorded an episode of the podcast called the ECT Jitters. I was worried about going into my first year as a fully qualified teacher. And I recorded that episode of the podcast to unpack some of my worries. I will link it in the show notes. So I went back and listened ahead of meeting the new maths graduates on the assumption that they might be experiencing some of the same anxieties as I was back then. And it turned out the main one for me was workload. I was worried that I just wasn't going to be able to manage the workload. Well, I always felt that I'd be able to get it done, but I didn't know how much life I'd have left behind afterwards. And I mentioned this to the uh, to the new maths graduates, and I could see lots of students nodding immediately. So I thought, great, I'm onto a winner here. And so I proceeded to explain to them that despite the fact that the workload increases a bit, you in fact have a lot more time to do it in. You have far more capacity for various reasons. I'm not. Gonna, I won't go over it again now. Like I said, I'll link that episode in the show notes. But I essentially spent half an hour or so talking to them about the best ways to manage workload, increase efficiency. Um, and I think the most important thing was how to prioritise your to-do list. So my two principles are, and it was my mentor who first told me about these two principles last year. And I've also since come across research that backs it up. So the two questions I think a teacher should ask themselves when trying to prioritise their to-do list are, does this improve the quality of my explanations? And does this make my students feel cared for? So those two questions together form a filter through which you can pass your to-do list and decide what's really important. So this, again, was something I shared with these new these new teachers. It was so very rewarding for a few reasons. The first one was it drove home to me how far I've come in a year. I've spoken before on the podcast about how it's important to keep in mind a sense of progress, yet in the hustle and bustle of teaching, it can be very easy to overlook. So it's important to check in every so often and think about how far you've come. And going back and talking to students who are in the same position as I was a year ago really drove home the fact that I've come a long way in a year. The second thing that I found very rewarding was that at the end of the session, the facilitator went round the room and asked each of these new teachers for a reflection on what they'd heard. And there was 30 or so in the room. And to hear them reflect my values that I'd just been talking about back to me was wonderful. And a couple of them said that after hearing me speak, they were no longer as scared about their ECT year. And the thought that I've made someone feel a little less scared about something was just so wonderful. So that was a great experience. And there were no behaviour issues. Who'd have thought? Amongst these student teachers, there were no behaviour issues whatsoever. I didn't have to dole out any detentions. They were just sat there listening, hanging even on my every word. Perhaps teacher education is the way forward. No, I'm joking. It can't compare to the wonderful carnage of the classroom. I hope you've had a good few weeks. 
and I'll check in with you again in a few weeks time. If you enjoyed this episode, please spread the word in person and on social media. You can follow me on Twitter at Mr. Brown Pod or email mrbrownpod at gmail.com. Please subscribe, rate and review in your directory of choice. Please also consider becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash Mr. Brown Pod and helping me cover the cost of producing the podcast. Thank you and talk again soon.